You are now listening to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. Monday morning matters. Perspectives from, from Southeast, Southeast Asia. Asia. Hey, good morning. This is Arlene, and you are listening to Drew and Asian, the voice of discovery and sharing. Today, on our Monday morning matters, we bring you interesting discussion on what's happening in Burma or Myanmar. They call it.、Uh, as we all know, the Myanmar election has just wrapped up, and we also have just know the result of the election where the NLD party or the National League for Democracy they won the majority of the votes. They will. Will be the next government in line for Myanmar. With us is Kin Omar, coordinator for Burma Partnership. It is an organization that is locally led by the Human Rights Advocacy Group, and she will be sharing with us her thoughts on the recent Myanmar general election, whether it's free or fair. First of all, hi and thanks for accepting our interview, Kin Omar. Thank you for having me too. Would you like to introduce yourself and your organization, Burma Partnership? Sure.、Um, my name is Ken Omar. I'm the coordinator of this organization called Burma Partnership, which is actually a Burmese activist-led regional network supported by the human rights advocates from across the Asia Pacific region, particularly from our ASEAN neighboring countries from. Indonesia, Philippines,、uh, who've been supporting the Free Burma movement for a long time, and、uh, we actually focus on the human rights advocacy,、uh, working with the local human rights human rights groups on the ground, and try to amplify their messages across to the regional and international platforms such as the ASEAN and the United Nations. What's interesting about the current、uh, election, which has took Please,、uh, recently, is、uh, a lot of the question whether it's free or fair. In your own opinion, working for human rights in Myanmar or Burma, do you think that the result reflect、uh, the spirit and the voices of the Burmese people? Oh, definitely, yes.、Um, if the election were fair and even more freer than、uh, when it was, where it was、uh, a week ago. The victory that NLD got, or the 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 people who you know who voted, it could have been even much more、uh, more than more than the current vic- victory. I would say that could have been even far more overwhelming majority vote that NLD could have got it. But because the election was.、Uh, Including the pre-election campaigning and the electioneering tactics and the ground situation, the it was not fair at all.、Mm-hmm. But yes, on the election,、uh, the voting day itself, it was、uh, somewhat、uh, free, but. It could have been even more. You know, NLD could have won even more vote than what it got now、mm-hmm. if there were a fair, a fair game.、Mm-hmm. How would you consider a fair game? Well, a fair game that I would say is such as, for example, the the election rules and regulations or the election laws,、uh, and it could have been、uh, more democratic. It could have been also the Union Election Commission could have been a transparent and non-biased,、uh, impartial. But now the Election Commission itself was not.、Uh, it it was biased definitely, and also it was not allowing a fair game for all in the playing field, and、um, that's that's one thing. And also, on the other hand, the ruling party、uh, for the past five years, they have got pretty much all the resources that they needed to play in this、uh, election game, where the opposition parties, including the NLD, had a、uh, quite limited resources, you know,、uh, that they needed. And in spite of that, the thing, the something that the ruling party never got is, of course. The trust and confidence of the people,、mm-hmm. and the people who who had to actually give their vote, and that's where the ruling party could not,、uh, they could not, in spite of the the resources that they had, 
all the resources that they needed, but they couldn't really get it because people, you know, ever since 1988, uh, democracy uprising, and then again in 1990 election where National League for Democracy won. Ever since then, now we pass another new generation, and yet you see how much people long for freedom and pe- how much people long for democracy and how much also people don't want the army, the military to continue to take control of their life. And that's what they proved last week. Mm-hmm. Very interesting uh, election campaign happened also prior to the election. Could you share more of your colleagues' experience? Because uh, if I'm not mistaken, you share earlier uh prior to the interview that uh, a couple of your human rights advocacy uh, colleagues were down there monitoring the whole election process. How fair was it? How good was it? Um, well, we, of course, you know, like um, from my our own organization, we had a couple of our, uh, our team members were there. But then also like as Burma Partnership, we are a part of a larger civil society network in the country. So some of our partner organizations and colleagues and also long-term activists from 1988, they've been also been uh, very actively, you know, uh, 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 on the ground, be whether for the uh, voters' education or monitoring. So, so yeah, we're not far from, you know, like knowing of what's really happening on the ground. So before the election, in terms of the um, the especially on the um, advanced votes problems, our um, our our members on the ground that they were able to uh, find that advanced vote was one of the major problem, mm-hmm. and um, basically the Union Election Commission there are a lo- many many uh, loopholes and flaws how they contacted. And for example, like the, un- the, U- the Union Election Commission di- did not disclose the exact number of the voters, registered voters list. So what that means is that, that, you know, we don't know what is the exact number of the people who actually registered to vote. Mm-hmm. They did disclose at the different local level constituencies level, which the the list always came uh, even after three times of the disclosure of the information, people still find to be information find you know to be uh, very wrong and inaccurate or missing. Um, so because of that, on the election day, um, in some cases, in some areas. There were more people uh, voted than the actual list that registered to vote. Oh, that's it's, very yeah. odd, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And also in many cases, also the people who uh, uh, actually try to correct their information that's been wrong, you know, like uh, wrongly uh, listed by the UEC, and they trying their best to correct those information, and they went to the polling station, and their names still were not on the list. Mm-hmm. Um, the election officials mm-hmm. didn't really take the uh, responsibility. The way that they responded to the people ever since before the election date is like, well, you come and give us that, you know, you come and uh, give us the, the information, but then they are not guaranteeing of those information will be actually corrected, yeah. you know. So it's, I mean, in terms of the UEC, there's so much problem with the UEC. Yeah. The, the way that how UEC contacted with their manner and attitude towards the people, it's like, you know, they don't take the, they should be the main person, a main body to take responsibility. So Instead, the election commission is mm-hmm. the ones that are not really upholding free free and fair election in Myanmar. But I want to go to another uh, topic that is also widely uh, criticized by uh, the people of Burma, which is uh, the catching of uh, the the rounding up of many activists and students in particular during the campaign period and even prior to the campaign period mm-hmm. itself. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Actually, there are many, many who have been arrested and detained. Um, and even like a couple of two, three weeks before the election, 
like two weeks before the election, there were student, uh, two or three student leaders were still arrested. Mm-hmm. And this actually kind of hampered uh, the way the military uh, deal with uh, the uh, the government itself. I mean, it shows that the military do not really respect freedom of expression. Do you think uh, after the election, uh, which which is now, do you think the military will respect further on the freedom of expression by the people of Myanmar? When it comes to the military, I have to say that I have no confidence or trust in their political will. Yes, they've been defeated. I mean, they are military back party. The ruling party been defeated for sure. But in terms of how or whether the military has a political will towards, you know, like uh, to be a part of the genuine democratic genuine democratization in our country, I don't think so. I I still don't have any trust in the the military because the way how. Uh, they have been uh, reacting even in the past four or five years of the reform led by President Thay Nguyen Say. In the, the reality is when it comes down to the actual uh, serious, like uh, uh, important political decisions, the president had no power. It's, it was actually is the army, the commander in chief, who's always been, you know, at the supreme. Uh, decision making power in his hand and of course you know he has the 25% of the and the parliamentary seat you know filling with his army uh, representatives in fact it's basically 25% for one man who is the commander in chief and in and also you know what is not fair of what happened in the last last weekend election day is the army soldiers Mm-hmm. It's like double. They did the double vote, double voting. They did the voting twice because first they got twenty five. They get twenty five percent automatic quota from the constitution, but they also voted on the election day in that seventy five percent of the civilian voting. That means they actually took the voting twice. You know, they did the voting twice. But also, just to come back to where the army is, and that's where. I would not be the only one if, you know, if you ask where, in spite of the overwhelming joy that we all are feeling now with the uh, uh, the victory of the NLD, but what would be the worry if you ask the people? I will not doubt the people will answer you. It's the will of the military, mm-hmm. the political will of the military. Will they be genuine enough to actually hand over the power to Aung San Suu Kyi and National League for Democracy? Or will they do some kind of tricks like they have ever done in the past? And they, you know, like basically they have 25% in the uh, parliament. They will continue to hold their key ministerial post according to the constitution. Mm-hmm. So the main problem of our country is this 2008 military drafted constitution where the army takes the, the control of the country's political and economic affairs okay so we'll, yeah yeah we will take a short break when we return we'll discuss we we'll continue the discussion on uh, the Myanmar election and the Myanmar government Monday morning matters perspectives from, from Southeast, Southeast Asia, Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. You're back with me again on our Monday Morning Matters. Uh, today we discuss about Myanmar post-election uh, with current Kin Omar, coordinator for Burma Partnership Human Rights Advocacy Group. So when it comes to Myanmar, as we all, as we all know, the Myanmar under the military regime is highly controlled by the power, uh, which is the military junta itself. Um, do you think the structure, the power structure will be changed when NLD comes in? Um, at the moment, it, it will, it was, it was to take a, 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 a quite a, a, quite a long time, I would say. Um, but of course, depends on how the NLD in the government will actually, uh, prioritize their push for the, uh, the genuine transition. I mean, right now, as you probably heard, Dong San Suji already, uh, sent a request, sent a letter request to, 
uh, to have a dialogue with the commander-in-chief, president, and also the speaker of the house mm -hmm. to talk about the reconciliation. Because the way that I see is, it's, I think it's a very good move from Don San Suu Kyi because the way how the, 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 the power structure is set in Burma, Myanmar at, uh, today, we cannot move, uh, move on as in the normal way as other countries after the election. Because the reality is the current, uh, 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 current, uh, power structure is still in hands of the military. So, Dong San Suu Kyi needs the army, the commander in chief, and the army elite, the military elite to be on board with her to actually proceed with the next steps after winning the election. So, Yes, it would, it would be a, a very nervous time. It, it is a nervous time already for us for the next few months before the actual time for the new government to take the office. Mm -hmm. And there will be, in my opinion, there will be a lot of political negotiations will be, um, uh, a lot of political ne negotiations will be made. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the key holder of our country's problems or the solution is in hands of the army. Mm -hmm. So will the Burma army make, uh, take the a step to come to the equal terms to negotiate with the uh, winning National League for Democracy? That's, talk, that, that would be the question. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about the NLD. Uh, were the Human Rights uh, Advocacy Group uh, a big supporter of the NLD during the campaign election? Um, you know, actually... Um, Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> um, honestly, for the human rights advocates of you know any anybody, we have a we have a more we we lean towards the, the with the hope and more thinking that if NLD wins the elections, if NLD is the government, we have a better chance of improving the human rights situation. So that's the common ground among us, but. Then, of course, people like myself, am I worried? Yes, I am. I am still worried. It's because the NLD is coming into the power structure where the structure is set by the military elites, where the military penetration is the key. So, for example, when it comes to the human rights protection, we're talking about a key ministry, such as the Ministry of Home Affairs. The Ministry of Home Affairs is in hands of the direct command of the army because the Minister of the Ministry of Home Affairs will always be, according to the Constitution, will always be a military general in service. Mm -hmm. so, and then, mm -hmm. yeah, so because of that, so the when it comes to, like you, you, you ask about the, the, the people, the activists being arrested, arbitrarily detained, and also facing the unfair judicial process, you know, where all kind of, you know, unfair uh, laws and are being charged against them. And we have no way to seek the justice in the country because judiciary is being submissive or under the command of this Ministry of Home Affairs and the army, you see. So, will Aung San Suu Kyi and her, her uh, government, will they be able to uh, change this civilian administration under the civilian rule? That's so, the yeah. going to be the key question. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, pressure to the Aung San Suu Kyi's National League of Democracy government or future government, whether they are able to have their, the democratic commitment to ensure that Myanmar will be a country that is free and fair in, at the end of the day. Um, moving on to another question about free and fair. Uh, I want to highlight on ethnic minority, especially minority uh, minorities to the north uh, in Rakhine State, uh, the Rohingya community. I know it's a very sensitive topic, but um, are they being marginalized? Uh, what, what is their status post-election? Will the Aung San Suu Kyi government uh, include that as part of the citizenship uh, discourse? You know, I definitely hope for that. But I am very worried because of, I mean, 
you ask me like you know where I was in terms of this uh, NLD or Dong San Suu Kyi when it comes to the human rights. Mm-hmm. Being a human rights advocate, I've been very worried of where the party might stand or could stand um, because you know for the election, National League for Democracy had to expel. They expel like twenty thousand white card holders. Majority are the Rohingya Muslim people. Mm-hmm. So. Well, has Rohingya population been marginalized? They have been very much. I mean, the marginalized is not even the the uh, uh, word enough to describe of where things are or their situation. They've been not only marginalized; they they have been not only ma- uh, marginalized, but they've been persecuted. So, Dawn San Suu Kyi and National League for Democracy will they actually um, uh, ensure? The, the the Rohingya people from this situation. It's still Honestly, a big question, is it? It was a, it is a question. It is a question. <laughs> I, I'm I'm only saying that it's because of where they have been so far, no? But then you see, like Aung San Suu Kyi has given the message to the to the to the the audience in different places that what she wants to see is a democratic country where there is a passion, a compassion. You know, it's uh, complying or, or, or practice, no? Um, where she wants to see this um, uh, uh, equality for everybody. Mm-hmm. But then, mm-hmm. but, but then uh, we're not seeing, uh, and I mean, NLD excluded the Muslim candidates. Yeah, that, that's another Russia. thing that I want to add on to the discussion this time because uh, at first you see the Rohingya community being excluded, right. and now you're seeing the Muslim. Uh, mm. candidates not allowing uh, to contest for the general election. Are you seeing more and more minorities being excluded from the the mainstream community? Or um, the mainstream yes. society? I would, I would say for until now, that's how, how things are at the moment. That's where we are very, very, very worried, really. Seriously worried for the danger, seeing the danger of where our country might be leading, you know. So, um, uh, but then, but then, let me let me let me t- say this first. If what NLD did to the minority members, like the Muslim members of their own political party, or how they've been silent or say not saying the not uh, taking the, the the right stand, principle stand on the humanity with the situation of the Rohingya population, well, if that is something. That is of their key campaign or election campaign strategy to be able to form the majority winning government. I think that they had to do that at the expense of the people pain and suffering. Yeah. So I want to give them a try. I want, I want, I want to give, give them a, a, a chance to prove that it was just a temporary measure in order to win over the military and their party mm-hmm. in this election. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I that understand. they form the but so that they form the government so that they are able to make the right policy for all the people of Burma, especially including the uh, long suffering uh, Rohingya population. Yeah. But and then I think mm-hmm. I think it's still a, a bit early for us to say at this point and let's see in the next few months or, or next year in particular will they give it a, a priority to end the suffering of these marginalized communities. Yeah. Anyway, we'll take another short break when we return we'll discuss further on the future of Myanmar. Monday morning matters. Perspectives from Southeast, Southeast Asia. Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. You're back with me again and with Kim Omar, Coordinator for Burma Partnership. With our discussion on the future of Myanmar post-election 2015, uh, going back to the history of Burma election, we all know Burma has a strong tradition and history of strong civil society um, even though you are faced with uh, a strong military junta that controls, that detects the lives of ordinary people. And you yourself uh, have been uh, uh, in the civil societies for many, many years. Um, did you vote for the recent general election? 
No, I was not able to because uh, first of all, I w- I'm not in the country, uh, and second of all, also like I need to, uh, you know, basically I need to reclaim my uh, citizenship, mm-hmm. citizenship back in the country, and I'm hoping with the uh, uh, Don San Suu Kyi's uh, coming into the, you know, like of uh, to the government, so under her government, hopefully I'll have a chance to reclaim my citizenship. Mm-hmm. And you were outside of the country for quite some time uh, but your name will be out from the blacklist tell me more about this blacklist that the military keep sure sure well I mean I was involved as a student activist um, I was one of the pioneers who organized the 1988 pro-democracy uprising known as the 48 or the 888 and um, after the military coup I was one of those who actually left the country across the border to the neighboring countries so ever since then I've been in uh, I've been an activist in exile you know like I did all like Campaigns for the political release of the political prisoners or release of Don San Suu Kyi. For all my past 27 years, pretty much I've been a campaigner on this human rights and democracy in back in my own country. And um, uh, because of my uh, my very vocal advocate work outside the country, including to the like uh, United Nations or the U.S. government, you know, Congress, and and all of these international forums that I've been, uh, I was basically, you know, uh, advocating for the change in the country. I've been put on the blacklist for a long, long time, ever since like that time. And uh, in 2012, late 2012, the President Deng Xiaoping government, it was also the time after they won the election, they released Aung San Suu Kyi and political prisoners. It was the time for the Burmese, uh, uh, the, 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 the President Deng Xiaoping also to go to United Nations. And that's the time the Burmese government, they announced the re- uh, removal of more than 2,000 uh, activists in exile, both the Burmese and, and foreign nationals. And I was one of those uh, who was re- removed from the blacklist and I re- applied to return to the country, uh, negotiated with the government. So the, the negotiation with the, the government was, you know, basically people like myself, my colleague, we said we will return to the country only if we could continue our democracy and human rights activism. Mm-hmm. Um, in the beginning, I mean, we asked for guarantee of our protection by according to the by by law as well. We needed a legal protection also because you know we know that this government at that point it was no way to be uh, uh, trusted. So we didn't really we didn't really get the the real guarantee of it. And yet we wanted to nevertheless we wanted to take that chance. So we returned to the country. But then we've been under the surveillance, intimidation, harassment, and threat all the time to the point until to the point that I was basically almost um, I was almost basically detained by the authorities in earlier of this month. Mm-hmm. And they yeah. asked me mm-hmm. they asked me uh, they asked me to stop talking to the international community. They asked me to stop talking to the media, and I said no. And then they said, if I cannot stop doing such, then they cannot guarantee my security in the country anymore. So that mm-hmm. was that was also a very, uh, uh, you know, like for me, it's like, well, if they don't keep their promise, and then they ask me to step down from my human rights activism, that doesn't work with me. You mm-hmm. know? I want to add more uh, of my question here, because you've been working uh, in human rights uh in the area of human rights for so long and once the Aung San Suu Kyi's and NLD government is formed I'm wondering uh, if you were being allowed to go back and they comply to their promises what's the first thing you, that you would do as a human rights advocate? Um, I would actually I would go back to team up with my colleagues in the country mm-hmm. and then uh, what we would do is first and for, right, even without not able to go back right now, but the most immediate call from uh, us as human rights advocate is the release of uh, political prisoners and the students and farmers and workers, you know, like activists who've been detained uh, in the past few months and the last couple of years. Uh, they need to be released immediately. Now, we have many uh, activists who are staging hunger strike in the prison where the prison authorities are actually torturing them because 
they are uh, doing the hunger strike. Mm-hmm. So we need we need this. Uh, we we cannot you know these people's uh, lives are at stake. They need to be released immediately. So my immediate uh, uh, work uh, now and and if I can go back is also to ensure that these oppressive laws are repealed or amended by the incoming new government. Mm-hmm. These repressive laws must be amended or repealed. And also the judicial sector reform is the key that I will advocate for the judicial sector reform as much as also the um, the ensuring of, you know, like the, 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 the incoming government have a, a great opportunity to improve the human rights situation. Mm-hmm. Basically by starting with the uh, like the release of the people, as much as also to ensure the uh, the judicial sector is also come to be under the civilian, independent, impartial role. No, so these will be the key. I mean, there's so many things that I would like to do. Yeah, there really. probably one thousand and one <laughs> things. But what about pressuring the government to change the constitution? Because the current one is from two thousand and eight. Yes. yes. Definitely, definitely. The, uh, the, the key, like I said, the, the key uh, to improve the human rights situation, the bottom line is changing the constitution. So the change in the constitution is the major thing that I will join my other colleagues also, that we will continue with our ongoing advocacy at the moment is also to change the constitution. And also, Aung San Suu Kyi and National League for Democracy, that is also one of their pledge. So we will con- definitely, that will be our key push in the coming months and years also. If not, you know, if we're not able to do that in months, we will have to keep pushing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you were to have uh, an opportunity to work together with uh, the 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 future government of Myanmar to change the constitution. What are the key amendments that you want to do in the constitution? Um. Oh gosh. Yeah, there are a lot. <laughs> just uh, just a <laughs> few, a brief highlights. One is the Article four four five four five five. Uh, basically, which gives the which provides the immunity to the state authorities or the security personnel. When they, uh, you know, they are provided with the immunity in the line of the duty, you know, like they call that, you know, in the line of the duty, if one they are performing the duty, anything, they cannot be taken action against. Mm -hmm. And that's where we will have a problem because you will not be able to hold perpetrators accountable because of that particular clause. I see. So, so that's, as a human rights advocate, that is one for me. And then, of course, the other is also the 25% of the army uh, guarantee. So, and whereas, mm-hmm. yeah, also, you know, like 25% of the army needs to be out. Whereas also the constitution amendment, you know, can only be uh, carried out with more than 75%. That needs to be changed too. That's um, that's also the, the 304, article 304, that needs to be uh, also amended. I see. So, and then there are many more to come as well. There are many more. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we are towards the end of our discussion, but it, is, it was really exciting uh, speaking to you, especially you working so hard and for so long, trying, uh, hoping to see uh, the day uh, Myanmar uh, return to democracy and hopefully the future of Myanmar will be brighter and uh, will be uh, a Myanmar that every Burmese and every people in Myanmar hope for. Thank you very much, Kino.